Welcome to Hope Church, everyone. My name is Jason, and I'm the lead pastor on staff. And if you're new here, you picked such an exciting season to come and be part of our church because next week is our last Sunday as a portable church, and then we are moving into our brand new facility. This is such an important season for our church that I asked a guest to come and address our church on the topic this morning. Pastor Josh Amstutz is the lead pastor of Lakeland Church in Delavan, Wisconsin. Lakeland is one of the fastest growing and most innovative churches in our state. I have so much respect for Josh's leadership as a pastor, but more than that, I appreciate that over the last couple of years, I've been able to become a friend. So please give a warm and loud Hope Church welcome to Josh. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. I am thrilled to be with you guys today. This is, uh, this is kind of got to be a little surreal. For those of you who have been around Hope for a while, a little surreal. I was in here and these guys were setting, your whole team was setting this up. By the way, give it up for those who have been setting up for years upon years upon years upon years upon years. They said as they, as they finish setting up, they're like, this is the last time we have to set up because they get to leave it up this week, you know? And, uh, and then it'll just be one final tear down. But I, I'm just so impressed uh, with you guys and, uh, and what God is doing here. I, I love Jason. I love Kathy. Um, I feel honored to, to uh, just be a part of, of um, I don't know, what God is doing in Wisconsin, and he's using hope in powerful ways as well. As Jason said, I'm from uh, the Lake Geneva area. My church is um, down there. Um, my wife and I have been there for about as long as Jason and Kathy have been here, so just uh, about 11 years now. Um, we've been kind of on a wild ride for the season that we've been there, and um, so some things that you need to know about me is I've got a I'm I am a dad, so happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. But I got probably all of you beat because I got nine kiddos. So, yes, they're all mine. Yes, I know how it happens. Uh, no, we don't homeschool. And, yes, we have a 12-passenger van. That's how it all works. That's always the order of the questions. So, um, but we have a ride of a time with, uh, with my family. And so just... Some, some fun things there. One of the things that you should know about just, uh, by the way, you guys all like Jason? Yeah. Good. You should keep him. Uh, let me just tell you, you should definitely keep that. I love Jason and Kathy, but I've, I've come to realize, like, uh, so I meet with Jason uh, every single month. Um, we've been doing this for, for years, a uh, group of pastors. Actually, Hope is a part of a network of churches. We've helped plant churches together kind of in southeast Wisconsin, and, um, and, and we just encourage one another. We keep each other accountable. We cheer each other on, and as things like what Hope is about to go through through this new season, we're able to kind of come alongside and say, well, here's what we learned along the way and what we discovered and what maybe you want to keep in mind as you get ready to step into uh, this next season. But one of the things that has been most impressive to be about to me about Jason is, yes, he loves hope, he loves his mission, he loves the community, and he's so sold out for what you guys are chasing after here, and I love that, but the guy's also just incredibly brilliant. I don't know if you knew this. I realized this, like, really, uh, I, I, I saw it when I visited about a year or two, two years ago. I sat right over here, and, uh, and he gets up to preach, and he goes the entire message without any notes. You don't know how big of a deal that is. I don't know if he's Rain Man. I don't know if he's crazy or brilliant, but he's probably somewhere in the middle. Uh, but you follow this guy, and so uh, congrats to that. But you guys follow a great leader, but you also are heading into such a fun season as uh, you're two weeks away from getting into your building. I come to you with a, a little bit of uh, excitement or some, I don't know, some excitement knowing what you're about to, to face, some encouragement for you, because I've been there a couple times. So since uh, being at Lakeland, we've built twice, actually, added on two auditoriums as we've grown. And um, with that, there's some things that you'll learn and some things that you kind of... Uh, glean along the way, and it's just an exciting season, and so I'm just grateful to be able to share with you guys today. Hopefully, I'll be able to encourage you as you get ready to step into the season, but to get us there, let me just tell you a story, give you a little glimpse into the weird family I live in, okay, and, and my crazy uh, brood of kids. So my, my family, as a pastor, something you need to know, pastors sometimes are just given things from people, so people often just kind of give us stuff, and by the way, I'm just going to say, keep that going on. 
okay? Give stuff to Jason and Kathy. They'll love it. But everyone, nine times out of ten, it's like great. You know, like just boxes show up on our, like, on our front porch or in my office or something like that. Uh, but um, nine times out of ten, it's good. One time out of ten, it'll be like, what was that person thinking? This was one of those times where I got this box of stuff. I'd bring it home, open it up, and my wife is like going through things. And in this box was a, a whole bunch of old trophies, and I'm like, you know, you just like throw them all away. And my wife's like, don't throw those away. I'm like, why? She's like, the kids will love them. I was like, what? Now, here's what you also need to know is that I'm from a very musical family, so we don't play a whole lot of sports. My wife and I, we like to exercise, but that's about it. We don't like do the team sports deal. And so doing musicals and band and singing, you get a certificate at the end of the year for participating. Whee! It's just not the same as all the athletes who get all these trophies. And so my kids genuinely don't have any trophies. They don't have any. So we pull out these trophies. Now, and these trophies that came out of this box, what else was really weird about them is, like, it would be one thing if they were, like, basketball and baseball, but they were really obscure things. They were, like, sailing, fencing. And for, like, 30 years ago, it was, like, a 1980s win of a sailing race. And what was so funny is my kids pull these things out of the boxes, and they start walking around the house with these things over their heads, like, cheering themselves on. And I'm looking at them like, this is the weirdest thing. And, uh, and as I, I'm laughing at them, I'm looking at them, like, with these sailing trophies, these fencing trophies now uh, over their head. And I'm like, guys, you, you know you didn't win that thing. And they're like, yeah, but it, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Now here's a question. Just because my child is walking over their head with a sailing trophy from 30 years ago race, does it make them the winner of that race? This is where you talk back. No, no. Uh, just because they have the trophy, does it make the winner of the race from 20, 30 years ago no longer the winner of the race? No, no, those people are still the, the winners. So in the natural sense, here's the deal. What you win is yours, right? In, in the natural world, if I win it, I'm always the winner of that thing. Here's the bizarre thing. In the supernatural, in the spiritual realm, this is this bizarre spiritual reality that, that what is won by an individual can actually get passed to the next generation. We actually see this all throughout Scripture. Think about it, all, all these passages that say stuff like this, where, where it says, and I will show my favor and my blessing to a thousand generations of those who love me and obey me, right? So that which I do in the spiritual sense actually can have an impact upon the next generation that in a way they can have a win based on how I live today, right? Are you alive? Okay, my congregation talks back a lot more than you guys do. You know, I have to unlock something in you guys. It's free. You're free. Amen. Okay, all right, so you, you can talk to me. Uh, today what I want to look at, though, is I want to look at a guy in Scripture who actually rides the wave of someone else's win into his own win. And, but it's, it's something that was won previously, and he recognizes the significance of that spiritual win and says this is going to be a part of my win for today as well. And the guy that we're going to look at is a guy by the name of Eliezer. Now, there's multiple Eliezers in Scripture, specifically in the Old Testament. One guy who's mentioned quite a bit is this guy. He's a, he's a priest. That's not the guy we're looking at. We're looking at Eliezer, son of Dodai, okay? And he's only mentioned in a grand total of five verses, so he's not mentioned a whole lot. Uh, but in these five verses, there's a, basically one main account of his life that is just kind of an astounding account. And so we're going to look at these five verses. It's found in two different places, in uh, 2 Samuel and in 1 Chronicles. So we're going to read both of these passages so we can get a holistic picture of what happens in this guy's life. Okay, so you guys ready? Yeah. Okay, good. Good, good. Good. Just checking with you. Okay, 2 Samuel. Are we okay? Okay, good. 2 Samuel 23, verse 9. Next to him was Eliezer, son of Dodai, the Ahoy. Okay, so now next to him, here's what's happening in this passage is he's giving a list of the mighty men. David had like 30 guys who were absolutely amazing, but in the list he had like a top three, and this guy's in that top three of the mighty men. So as one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastamim for battle. Then the Israelites retreated, but Eliezer stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eliezer, 
but only to strip the dead. Okay, so he, uh, that, that's, his, that's his whole life story right there. It's one kind of account is what, we, uh, is what we're given. But what's interesting is he's one of three of like the top three. I don't know what you have to do to get in the top three, but clearly it's something pretty astounding, pretty amazing. But all of David's mighty warriors were all pretty amazing guys. They were incredibly brave. They, uh, they were uh, risk takers. They were all great warriors. So what makes Eliezer's uh, actions here is kind of so significant that everyone in all of Israel is like, that is a story worth remembering and definitely throws them into the top three. Well, let's read also the other account in First Chronicles. There's a few other details uh, that we pick up there. Okay, so First Chronicles 11, it's 12 through 14. Next to him, it's going to sound the exact same as before, was Eliezer, son of Dodai, the Ahoy, one of the three mighty warriors. Okay? He was with David at Pastamim when the Philistines gathered there for battle at a place where there was a field full of barley. Okay, so it's a barley field. The troops fled from the Philistines, the same as before. And then a little insight here to what happened. They took their stand in the middle of the field. They defended it. And they struck down the Philistines, and the Lord brought about a great victory. All right. So in this passage, what we see here is we see this. There's a couple, like, interesting words that I think kind of unlock this whole story. This one right here where it says, they what? They what? They defended it. So if they're defending land, it means that it's theirs, right? It, it, it means that at some point, they won this land. They they. There was a battle or there was something that took place that it became their land, that they're holding their ground and they're going to defend this land. So what in the world happened in this field? Where is this field that they are defending, this thing called Pas Damim? Okay, so it's about 13 and a half miles west-southwest of Jerusalem. That's like actual location of where it was. It was also referred to in Scripture as Ephes Damim, which means the, the border of blood. So there was a lot of bloodshed that happened in this valley. It was actually a valley, um, and it's mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 17, as well as in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, it's between Soko and Ezekiah, which are also mentioned in other passages. And so Eliezer's actions are amazing. I think we would all agree. That's amazing. He stood his ground. His hand freezes to the sword. He defeats an entire army that's basically attacking him, and he defends this land. But while his actions are significant, I think the where is more important than the what. I think this where, this pastamim, is the profound thing that makes him land in the top three. Because everyone else, like if you're an Israelite, everyone else goes, I know what happened in that valley. And I know why it's so significant. And I know why he should be in the top three. It's because of what happened in this place called pastamim. It's the where. And so I'm going to read out of 1 Samuel chapter 17 something else that happened in this valley in Pastamim. Okay, so let's read it. And as I read this, some of you, you're going to have some light bulbs that are going to start going on. Some, for some of you in the room, some of you watching at home right now, uh, and others, if you're like, I don't have a light bulb, I'll help connect the dots for you, okay? So this is what it says. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled uh, at Soko in Judah. They pitched Camp at Ephes Damim, same place. Pastamim, Ephes Damim is the same place between Soko and Ezekiah. Okay, verse 2. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Ella and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites the other with the valley in between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. And just as I read verse 4 there, some of you are like, oh, I know what happened in this field. If you're sitting there going, no, I don't know what happened in this field, connect the dots for me, Josh. Here's what happened. This is this epic account in Scripture of this battle between David and Goliath. So what, if, if you're like, what's that whole story? Okay, so you've got the Philistines who basically are taunting the Israelites and this guy by the name of Goliath. It's, it's a word that often gets a, applied to anything big, right, today. 
We're like, man, that dog's a Goliath. That, uh, that person's like just a Goliath. It's, it's because of this biblical account of this guy named Goliath who was literally a giant. He was like nine feet tall, and he'd come out, and every day he would curse God, curse the Israelites, and say, you send out your best warrior to fight me one-on-one. Whoever wins, the other nation will serve the other. So if the Israelites win... Philistines will serve you. If the Philistines win, if Goliath wins, Israelites, you're going to serve us. And so David arrives, and this is before King David is King David. He's just a shepherd boy. He has no fan base. He has nothing going for him. No one's like a big fan of David. And all of a sudden, he arrives on the scene, and he says, I'll take on Goliath. And as a little shepherd boy, he heads out there with a sling and some stones. He knocks down Goliath with with a, a rock right to the forehead, and then he chops off Goliath's head with Goliath's own sword. And it's what begins David's entire career career, if you will, happens right here in this field. This amazing kind of God moment. And so now here you have, you got Eliezer, who's standing in the field beside David, taunting the very people that David already uh, conquered years and years and years before, right? So now all of a sudden, what, 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 what's going on? I can imagine that This time they're taunting the Philistines because God has already given them this land with and given them this victory over these people one time before. So all of a sudden, the now they're it says that the whole Israelite troops they all retreat though. I can imagine what probably Eliezer going, Where are you guys going? Now, why why do they retreat? I don't know, we can only speculate. That there's probably way more Philistines than there are Israelites. They're probably outnumbered. They're outmanned. And so everyone else runs, but Eliezer and David hold their ground. And they just stand there while everyone else retreats. And I love in verse 10 that it says he stood his ground. It doesn't say he bravely fought. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't say he bravely fought. It says he stood his ground because I think it's the ground that's more kind of astounding and important than how brave he was in that moment. He's standing here with David, and I believe that he stands there and he holds his ground, not just out of nostalgia or out of friendship to who David is, but in the sense of like, I I imagine he's almost looking at David like, hey, it's the same people, same field, we're totally outnumbered, we can't lose. I'm with the guy who did it all by himself against that entire nation years and years and years before. I imagine he's sitting there going, I, it's impossible for us to lose. We can't lose this ground. God's already delivered it to us once, and now I'm with the guy who was, already went through it once. We've got this. And so what happens? He fights, and his hand grows tired, right? Now, I don't know about you, but what happens to, to your grip if your hand grows tired? You lose your grip, right? But it says his hand froze to the sword. How's that possible? Well, it's possible because God's the one who gives him the strength and the power to do it. It's like he's losing his grip and God's like, I know what I'll do. I'll just attach that thing to your body. Now, continue fighting. Because here's the deal. In your weakness, if you're in a God-ordained battle, God is going to make you strong. And he's the one who's going to bring you the victory anyhow. Right? Right? Yeah, you talk back. It's good. I don't know if you ever feel weak in life. If you ever feel like you're just overwhelmed in life. Anyone ever been there? I have. Where you just feel shot, you feel worn out, you feel weak. Well, guess what? You're in a perfect place. If you're walking with the Lord, even in that place of weakness, you're going to experience what the Apostle Paul kind of describes in 2 Corinthians when when he says this. He says, uh, this is God talking to him, saying, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And now Paul starts to talk about that for himself, and he says, now I'm going to boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power might rest on me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And if you ever feel weak and you're like in the middle of a battle, and the, but you feel like it's a God-ordained battle and the Lord has led you out into it, then guess what? You're perfectly positioned for God's strength to be displayed in you. 
So don't be overwhelmed in that moment and say, I feel incredibly weak. All right, so God's going to make me strong in the midst of this battle. Who gave, who gave David the victory over Goliath? God, very good. By the way, when you're in church, it's usually God, Jesus, or the Bible, okay? Those are three answers. You're almost always good, or yes or no. So uh, just go with it. Who gave Eliezer the, the victory over the Philistines here? God. And all God is looking for is he's looking for the person who's willing to hold the ground, wield the sword, and stand in the field bravely, perhaps while everyone else is going, is running. All God's looking for is he's looking for someone who he can show his strength and his power through that individual. And if you're willing to fight the battle, hold the sword, God will make sure that you don't drop it and he'll give you the victory. Now, I know some of you are thinking, this is great, Josh. Next time that I'm facing an angry horde of Philistines, I will keep this in mind. <laughs> but the truth is we know that you're not going to be facing an angry horde of Philistines, but you will have hurdles and trials and difficulties and things where you're going to need to see God come through and God overcome whatever you're facing, right? And so what do you do on that day? Well, you, you bravely step into that place where the Lord has led you, and even in your weakness, you say, God, I'm going to trust that you are going to make me strong. One of the things that I love most about this account is how Eliezer's faith is actually spurred by David's original faith, right? David was the one who originally stood in the field. And Eliezer just chooses to step into that same spot. And he really rides the faith, rides the wave of the faith of, of David in the, first, in the first place. Here, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen um, God show up in someone else's life? Like they, they did something super bold and something big with their faith. And you're like, that was amazing. And you were inspired by that. Have you ever seen that, experienced that? Great. It's, it's so, I like, I love that when I see someone else like demonstrate faith and you're like, man, I'm so inspired by the way that that showed up. Have you ever run into a situation in your life where you're like, man, I need God to show up in this situation in my life in the same way he showed up in their lives? Have you ever experienced that? Kind of that moment where you're like, I need God to show up in my life because I, I saw him show up somewhere else. Here's the deal. Where he showed up somewhere else, I believe it happens so that yours and my faith would actually be inspired to step into our own victory later. Let me give, let me give you an example. So uh, this is less than two months ago, about a month and a half ago, my family and I, we were on a little vacation. We were away for about a week. And one of the places that we went, we went down to like the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter. But one night, we also stayed at a water park. And so uh, this is one of these big water parks, and you're just kind of going and exploring and having fun for the whole uh, evening. And it came to kind of the end of the night, and I had seven of my nine kids were with me. A couple of them are in college, and so, but seven of them are on the trip, and I couldn't find two of my boys. So they're somewhere in this park. It was my six-year-old and my 16-year-old are, are gone. They're together, so I know they're fine. And I tell my wife, I was like, I'll find them, don't worry. And so I start walking around this water park looking for them, and after about 15 minutes of looking and looking and looking, I cannot find them anywhere. So I come back to my family. I was like, why don't you guys all go to the room? I'll stay here. I'll find them. You know, don't worry. And so they all go, all right, we'll go. So they go, and I keep walking around the water park for another 15 minutes. I cannot find my, my boys. And so it's now like a half hour has gone by, and I'm kind of exhausted. I'm a little frustrated. But these water parks, there's like slides going everywhere and laser rivers everywhere. And there's like so many places for kids to get lost. And so I, kind of in a last-ditch effort, I go, God, I need some help. And I think I literally said it out loud like that. And literally at, I, within a half second, I see my two boys all the way across the water park just for a second go through like my, my vision, and I go running all the way across, and I go and grab them. And I thought to myself, and I was sharing it with my congregation the following week, just a, kind of this, a picture of how often do we try to solve our own problems? Because that's what I told my wife. It's like, I got this, right? I got a problem? No problem. I'll solve it. I got it. And then a whole half hour goes by before I'm like, I apparently don't got it, right? And then I finally, kind of in desperation, cry out to the Lord. And I was just sharing with our church how, how often I try to solve it first and in last-ditch effort go to God, and how would life look differently if we swapped that? And so anyhow, I, I, I shared that story. Well, there was a lady 
in uh, our church that day in that service who that week she had lost her laptop. She had left it on top of her car while she was strapping her, in her kids to the car and then t- took off. And for three days, she's trying to find it through, like, you know, ping services and, uh, and through the, 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 the authorities. And she's working with the police, and they're checking all these places, and to no avail. So she hears me tell this story, and she's like, huh, I've been looking for this thing for three days, and I haven't asked God for any help. So as we close in prayer, she, goes, she just prays a simple prayer. God, you know where my laptop is. Lord, would you please bring it to me? Within 10 minutes, she gets a, a, a text message from one of her clients who knew she had lost her, her laptop with a snapshot, a picture of her laptop that had just been listed on Facebook on like a, a community page just saying, hey, I found this lost laptop. Do you know who's it is? Anyone know any leads? It was listed within minutes of her praying. So she just messages me, and she's like, you'll never believe what happened. So the next week, I tell her story in church. Following day, Monday, another lady from our church, she loses, my church loses a lot of stuff, okay? <laughs> Monday morning, a lady loses her medication. It's like this medication costs $2,500 a month, expensive medication. She lost her month worth. And she's like, man, I heard Pastor Josh tell about how he lost his stuff. He prayed. The lady lost her laptop. She prayed. And she's like, I've lost this medication. And so guess what she did? She prayed. And within minutes, a coworker calls her and says, I just found some medication with your name on it in this really weird place at work. And she's like, oh, my word, I can't believe I lost it. I left it. And, uh, and, and so, so then she messages me. I got a story for you, but are you catching this? That See, one person's faith becomes this thing of like where I saw a victory becomes the next person's victory becomes the next person's victory becomes the next person's victory. Just like David's victory became Eliezer's victory and is supposed to become the p- children of Israel's victory and so on and so forth. But it's not this thing where it's like God doesn't just show up just be like, look at that, I'm done. I believe every place where God shows up, it's so that we would be able to tell a testimony that would inspire someone else's faith to say, I want to see God show up in my life in a similar way. And I'm going to step into it. That, that it's not just David who's the guy who takes the field, but there, there would be other individuals like Eliezer and others who would take the field as well. Are you getting this? Yes. And when I think about even, uh, I asked Jason a little bit about the history of hope. Are you aware there are some people, I believe, who have, I know it's symbolic, but have taken the field here? Jason talks about, he's referred to, at least he told me that he's referred to the 30. That there were the 30, some some 30 people who originally launched Hope without even having a, a senior pastor who were brave enough and bold enough to kind of, with this dream of take a field and then watch God bring about a victory. And he, Jason has talked about years and years of hundreds of people serving kind of constantly, constantly, even when the church was small, just consistently serving because their soul sold out to the mission and the vision and the harvest that they believe God wants to bring about and reach right here in this community. And I believe that, uh, that there were the 30 who already fought the battle. They already stood the ground, and they already have seen a victory. And if this is your first time here, maybe you're sitting here going, this is great. I, I heard this church is moving into a building. Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> And maybe that's what has gotten you here, but here's the deal. You need to know that there were others who have gone before you, before this moment. They had an idea of a building when it was just that. It was just an idea. And yet they kind of boldly stepped into a field, literally, where a church building is, has been built. And they, they stepped into that field and said, I, I believe God wants us to take this ground. And now the question is, are, are you going to sit back and just kind of ride that wave and, and hop into the building? Or are you going to say, no, me too. I, I, I don't want to just know of someone else who did something bold for Jesus. But I too want to have a story to tell of doing something bold for, for Jesus. You know, in my church's history, there have been a few people who I would say really boldly stepped into the field. One of those guys is a guy by the name of Rich Milney. And he was able to step into a field and kind of wield a sword in a unique 
way, a, a unique gifting that he could do, and it was in a financial way, where he took some big, bold steps to financially give and make it possible for Lakeland to exist. And uh, just a couple years ago, Rich passed away. And the founding pastor of Lakeland came down, and he, uh, he gave the funeral the message. And he was sharing at, the, at Rich's funeral. And he said this, and it was some profound words. He said, I don't know if Lakeland would be here if not for the great generosity of Rich and his wife, Donna. Now, that's like, those are strong words. I don't know if this would be here if not for the brave way that they kind of stepped forward, the bold steps of faith, and the, the brave ways that, that they gave generously. I mean, that was the unique sword that I guess Rich was able to wield, but he still did it in an incredibly risky and brave way that made it possible for Lakeland to be where we are to, today. And I don't know about you, but... Where might the Lord be calling you to boldly step into the field? Wield the sword, because others have done it before you. And where might he be calling you right now uh, to do that? Because God used King David, and God used Eliezer, and God used the 30, and God uses Pastor Jason, and God use, uses Rich Milneys and, rich, and other people like him. And I believe it's time. It's time for, if you've been on the sidelines, it's time for you to step into the field. And maybe the Lord right now is stirring in you that, that now is the time to step into the field and wield the sword, maybe joining a serving team here at Hope. Or maybe you're sitting one of the, you're one of those people and you're like, I feel like the Lord's stirring. And I can, yes, uniquely wield the sword in the realm of finances. And maybe I just need to make a big, bold step and, and give generously in this next season. Or maybe it's leading a group or whatever it might be that the Lord is saying, yes, now is the time not to just ride someone else's way, but actually step into it for myself. I believe the next few years are going to be some of the most exciting years at Hope. They really are. They're going to be a riot. And you get to experience it because others have gone before you. But now the question is, how about for yourself? Are, are you going to also step into this field? I want to make one final observation. It's, it's 2 Samuel 23, verse 10. It's this one little line right here in the middle of the account. It says this, the Lord brought about a great victory that day. But check this out. The troops returned to Eliezer, but only to, to strip the dead. So remember how everyone else runs, remember? Everyone else retreats. But they return, but only to strip the dead. Meaning they show up after the victory's been won by a single individual. After Eliezer fights the victory and God shows up, then they show up. This may be one of the most sobering verses in this entire passage. Because... I would argue that all of the troops, the entire army, was actually supposed to be a part of the victory. It wasn't, I don't believe it was supposed to be just for Eliezer. He's the one who does the big bold thing by himself, but everyone else, else, everyone else ran. And then they just show up afterward. Now they get to enjoy the victory, right? They're there like, we won, but we were not a part of it. He and God, and then we just get to kind of enjoy the splendor of this victory. And unfortunately, the same thing happens in churches all the time. A few take the field, and then everyone else shows up later to fill the building. A few bravely step in, and then a, a bunch of others just kind of hop in and go, oh, yeah, we're a part of this victory, but they really weren't a part of the victory doesn't mean that they don't get to celebrate it and still get to say, yes, God did something powerful. It's just that they don't have a story to tell in the midst of it. And that's, I think, the sad thing is that uh, these people, they don't have a story to, to tell uh, besides, I showed up to strip the dead. I, I had a friend in uh, college. His name was Josh Bailey. And we used to do this thing at the end of the year uh, when we were in college. In the, in the, in the spring, we lived in Chicago. And every spring, Lake Michigan always, uh, you know, freezes out a ways and then it starts to thaw. And on a hot day, like a hot 50 or 60 degree day in the late spring, uh, as the lake starts to thaw, me and my whole floor of guys, we would always go down to Lake Michigan and we would always do this. I know it sounds crazy. It really wasn't that crazy. But we'd run out on the lake till someone fell through. So now I know you're like, I'm out. 
I don't believe anything this guy says from here on out. Like, or I don't want to follow this guy. No, it, just tr trust me. We weren't that bad. We were doing it in shallow water where we knew people were going to fall through, but like waist deep, and that's all. And so anyhow, we had one of my closest friends, his name was also Josh, Josh Bailey. And uh, we'd go down to Lake Michigan, and we're all getting ready to run out, out, on, the, out on the lake until we fall through. And uh, Josh would always be standing there going, guys, I don't know. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to do this. And we would look at him, and I, you call it like manipulation or guilt or shame. I don't, I don't care. But we would look at him and we'd say, Josh, what are you going to tell your grandkids? <laughs> and he probably would be able to say, I was the wise one and stayed on shore. But no, it, we were telling him that because I was like, listen, we're all going to have the story to tell. Because I know years from now, we're going to tell our, our kids and then our grandkids, yeah, we used to run out on Lake Michigan until someone fell through. It was always a ride. Oh, it's always so much fun. And Josh, you're going to be sitting there going, yeah, and I always stood on shore. <laughs> and so Josh would always reluctantly join us and usually be the first one to fall through. But... But he has a story to tell in the midst of this, like, our fun little adventure that we would often do. And I just wonder how often did the people here, or how often could that have happened for the, for the Israelites? Can you imagine these kids that are, like, thinking about Eliezer, and they know the story, and they ask Grandpa, Hey, Grandma, Grandpa, you were out there. Like, you were there. You were young with Eliezer when he was that young guy, and he stood in the field. Where were you? And they're like, ah, oh, yeah. I was one of those that ran. Like, God brought about a great victory. I just don't have a story to tell in it. And I believe the Lord doesn't want just a few to have a story to tell. He wants all of us to have a story to tell. He wants you to have a story to tell, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you at home, and every one of us to have a story to tell about God's faithfulness and God showing up in powerful ways. But it starts with us taking that bold step and saying, I'm going to step into the field. I'm going to wield the sword. I'm going to just take this bold step of faith that I know he's calling me to take. And here's, a, of all the people that give us the greatest picture of why in the world we can even have a victory, it's Jesus. Like, he's the one that sets the pace for, like, hey, if there's, if there's anyone uh, who won a victory for us that we can ride the momentum, it's what he won for us at the cross, right? Like, Jesus, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Isn't that bizarre? That, we would, that he looks at us and he says, hey, I'm going to take your sin upon myself, and you want to know what I'm going to give you? I'm going to give you what I have, which is my victory and my righteousness. I was reading this verse this week uh, out of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. This is mind-blowing. Just think about this. For he, this is God, God raised us from the dead along with Christ. Talk about a victory. And he goes, hey, Christ's resurrection, you get to ride that wave. And he seated us in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ Jesus. That literally, his victory becomes our victory. His life becomes our life. His victory over sin is our victory over sin. And because of that, man, we can step into anything, any field that's in front of us and boldly say, hey, I, I can go there because Christ is with me and he's already won this victory. You guys alive? You guys ready for the season ahead of you? This is one of the most exciting seasons. Don't sit on the sidelines. Now is such a great time to step in and say, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm going to take some big, bold steps of faith. Serving, giving, in a group, whatever it might be, inviting people, I'm going to take some bold steps. God's done it before in others. He's going to do it in me. Let's stand. I'm going to close here in prayer. Then the worship team is going to come on out and lead us in a song. But let me just pray over you. Lord, I thank you for everyone here at Hope. I thank you for what you are doing in this church. Lord, I pray that you um, would right now, in a way, commission these people, commission this church body to step into the field in a way that perhaps some have already been doing. Maybe for some, this is going to be a first. It's going to be a new thing that they've never done before. But Lord, I pray that there would be an embold, uh, like a, a bold faith that just stirs up within people, recognizing God has used others before me and he is also going to use me. 
just like he used David and then he used Eliezer and he used many throughout all of history, he will continue to show up and show off in those who boldly take steps of faith. Say, God, would you use me in my community? And so, Lord, use this church in ways that's just beyond what they could ask or imagine. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.